Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we gather together for worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. And as we do so, a few announcements uh, to begin our time. First of all, uh, be in prayer this week uh, for the women's retreat, uh, which will be next uh, Friday and Saturday up at Bon Clarkin. Again, be prayer for all the preparations this week for safe travels for those attending. Also, uh, for the high school retreat in two weeks, which will also be up at Bon Clark. And again, uh, as part of the announcements in there, uh, we uh, did uh, find a, a male chaperone. So again, uh, you know, just as a notation there for your announcement, but be in prayer for the high school retreat. Also, for those interested in the middle school retreat, that will be the last uh, weekend in March. And uh, anybody interested in going, please let Miss Brandy know uh, by next uh, Sunday. Uh, that way uh, we can get uh, everybody signed up and everything. But again, we encourage y'all uh, to go to the middle school retreat. And we give thanks again for the opportunities that God gives for our uh, young people uh, to attend uh, to the means of grace. Now, as we begin the, the worship this morning, of course, uh, we will be celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper today. And uh, I'll, uh, uh, again, uh, talk a little bit more about some of the logistic things uh, here in a little bit, but just as a reminder, uh, we uh, will uh, give out the elements, uh, uh, one, uh, both of them at the same time, but uh, we will continue to celebrate them individually and take them uh, together corporately. But again, we give thanks for the opportunity uh, and for those prepared uh, the elements uh, for our uh, blessing today. But as we begin to worship, let us do so through a moment of... Oh, <clears throat> thank you. There is a, a missions committee meeting uh, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. <laughs> and uh, so, again, if you're on that committee, please uh, 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 mark that down on your calendar. Again, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Amen. Our call to worship today comes to us uh, from the Gospel of John. We read verses 14 through 17 of the opening chapter. Again, let us hear the word of our God as we are called to worship through his blessed word. Again, John chapter 1, beginning there at verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we have come to see the Lord Jesus this morning and be reminded of his grace, let us now stand together as we join together with one voice proclaiming the good news of our God. Let us open with Bible song number 299. Let us stand and let us sing together.
as we do testify that on the Lord our God and upon the Lord Jesus Christ do our hopes rest on this blessed Lord's day. Let us come now before this self-same God as he calls us once more to worship through prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the God of heaven and of earth. And you have called us out of the darkness into the light of your marvelous grace. Dear God, this morning we give thanks for the Sabbath day, uh, for this day of rest that you have blessed us with. That we might gather together with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And that we might look forward to the second coming of our Redeemer. Dear God, our hope is truly in the heavens and in the God of the heavens. May our hearts and our minds be focused upon that glory this morning. Let us put aside the trials and tribulations of this world, those things which are passing away, and but for a moment meditate upon the eternal, the everlasting, and the blessed. And to God, we pray these things in the name of your Holy Spirit, but for your power to be present in our hearts. We gather now together, saying the words their Son taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we have said these words, and as we say them as those who know the hallowedness of our Heavenly Father, we turn once more to the Holy Scriptures that He has given to us by His grace. As we come and as we read from 2 Samuel chapter 19, beginning there at verse 31. And hear the word of the Lord from 2 Samuel 19, beginning at verse 31. And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogalim and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. And he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed in Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, Come! across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. Barzillai said to the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today eighty years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again, that I may die in my own city. To the grave of my father and mother, but here is your servant, Chimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king, and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Jim Ham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now whatever your request of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Let us now be seated. I invite the children to come forward for a letter. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. How y'all doing today? Good. good. Y'all glad to see that uh, yellow orb in the sky this morning? Yes. <laughs> no. I like how everybody turned and looked at it. Uh, as, uh, you know, it, it's nice, again, to have the sun out, right? To have heat, to have all of these things, right? And, of course, last week we talked about, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about how everything is a blessing from the Lord, both the sunshine 
and the rain, the cold and the heat, all of it comes from the hand of our God. And one of the things as Christians that we learn is to be content, to be thankful for everything that God gives us. Because we know that he's smarter than we are. And he knows what we need, even when we may not be able to see that for ourselves. Now, I have a question for you today. What's all this? Communion. Communion, food. right? That's food. That's true. Right? This is communion. Now, what is this for? Does anybody know? The Passover. Right? Passover, right? The Lord's well, Supper. Sit, right? The Lord's Supper. It's similar to the Passover, right? Yeah. And one of the things we do at the, at the Lord's Supper is that we remember right, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. And you, know, you mentioned this to the Passover. The Passover came when the people of God were in Israel. And you remember there that God told them to take a choice a lamb, right? a, a lamb without blemish, and that they were to sacrifice the lamb and then put the blood of the lamb on the frame of the doors. Now, do we still do that? No, right? We, we don't put blood on our door frames, right? Now, if you came back to the house and saw blood on the door frames, what you'd would you... you call the FBI. Right, you'd call the FBI, right? You, you, would, you would get in contact with the authorities, right? It's not something that we would need to see, right? But, right, the symbol of what we have at the table is the same thing, right? We drink the juice as a remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at bread and we look at, at, at juice, you know, what is the, you know, when we look at it, we think, well, you know, bread and juice, how does that represent body and blood? The bread is the body and the um, juice is the blood. That's right. Now, who told us to do this? That's right. Jesus did, right? Jesus gave us this table. Now, Jesus gave us this table not just so that we would have a memorial, right? We would just kind of do something for, you know, for, for, you know, whatever reason, but because we believe that the taking of the bread and the drinking of the cup actually does something for us. Okay? We grow spiritually by the taking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. And that's an important thing to remember as we approach the table, that something actually happens here. Okay? It's not like any other meal, right? This isn't like you know, Wednesday night supper, right? This isn't like eating breakfast in the morning, right? That there is something that God does at the table. And that's one of the reasons why it's important that we come to the table with faith, with believing that these bread and this cup is for our benefit, right? For our blessing, okay? Well, and, and so as we take the cup and as we eat the bread and as we watch others do that today, I, I want you all to think about what Jesus Christ has done for our sins and how we are blessed in him. Right, y'all ready to pray? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for uh, the, uh, the, the, the pictures you give us of salvation, of the way that you've given to us this table, that we might be refreshed, nourished, uh, by your son, dear God, may we come to this table trusting in you in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Part of our preparation in coming to the table is uh, reaffirming our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we do that is by singing together. By opening up our uh, hymn books to number 146 and reminding ourselves again of the blessings of this day. Let us stand. Let us sing together.
Please be seated. As we come now before the Lord our God in this time of prayer, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Our great and almighty heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of covenantal blessing, and the God who has given to us this day, this glorious Sabbath day, that we can rest in you. We have heard the call of the gospel we have heard the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God, as we hear these words once more this morning, may they be fresh upon our hearts. Dear God, may we return once more to the beauty of your good news, that Christ is dead for sinners, that Christ is has given new life unto his people. And that new life we have in abundance today because of the great comforter, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in our hearts, who lifts us up out of the doldrums and into the blessings of your kingdom. And dear God, we live today as citizens of your kingdom, citizens of the heavenly city, those who have been set apart and made holy for your righteousness and for your name's sake. Dear God, as we again consider just how amazing these truths are, dear God, may you bring encouragement unto our souls this morning. For dear God, we have been encouraged uh, through the hearing of your words of the blessings that you gave to Barzillai, and of the way that you watched over David, even in the, in the midst of the attempts to destroy him. We were reminded uh, today of the call of John the Baptist, whom you sent beforehand to make ready for the coming king. And dear God, as we hear from uh, John the Baptist, we are not worthy of these things. We are not capable of making these things. We are the receivers of your gift. We are the ones who bear the very shed blood of the Lamb. We are the ones who wear his garments. And we are the ones who have been brought out of bondage to slavery into the freedom and liberty of the Christian faith. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we meditate upon these truths um, uh, deeply this morning, and as we think more about the life that you have called us to live as, uh, as those, again, who have been granted this gift of faith, we pray once more, dear God, that you will open our hearts to see where it is we are weak, that you will show us where it is we fall short. That we might be, be, made, be made more Christ-like each and every day. That we might know where we need to ask for your strength. Dear God, we are aware of certain places in our lives where we need to put to death the old man and live in light of Christ. Dear God, we're praying especially this morning for those things that our blindness does not allow us to see. God, may you open our eyes to see these things. Dear God, may we long to have our eyes open to see our own sin. Dear God, we confess that far too often we don't want to know the truth. 
We don't want to be made aware of where we need you. We are satisfied with keeping you in your place and being the captains of our own destiny. Dear God, we ask forgiveness of that particular sin this morning. We pray, dear God, that we would lay all things at your feet, that we would trust you with every fiber of our being, that we would ground our entire existence upon the goodness of your grace. Dear God, there is no other foundation that is as sure as the rock of our Redeemer. For truly, dear God, we see the consequences of building upon the shifting sands of culture, the shifting sands of history. There is one sure thing, that you are the God of history, <coughs> and that all kingdoms are called to bow their knee unto you. And that begins with our own hearts, with our own families, with our own relationships. Dear God, we pray these things in your mercy. For dear God, we know, again, that you are the God who hears the prayers of your people. That you are not traveling this morning. You are not in a far land, but you are present in this place. And we know these truths because you have made a promise. And dear God, when you make a promise, you always fulfill your word. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, as we are reminded of these truths. Dear God, we lift up unto you our community this morning. We pray for those who are wandering, those who are backsliding, those who are lost. We pray, dear God, that you would give us the right words to say, to call out to those who do not want to listen. We pray, dear God, that you will season our conversations with your grace. Dear God, we pray for opportunities to speak these truths to brothers and sisters in the flesh as well as brothers and sisters in the spirit. And dear God, uh, may we if we find ourselves in similar straits, be willing to hear from our brothers and sisters in Christ. But dear God, this is the true test of humility. And dear God, as we pray for our community of faith this morning, we pray, dear God, for those who are struggling today. We pray, dear God, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon them. We pray for those who are dealing uh, with the, uh, the weight of this world. God, may you take that weight off of their backs. May they know the refreshing peace of Christ. We pray, dear God, for those who are struggling uh, with uh, illness and uh, with disease and with uh, physical ailments. We pray, dear God, that they would be encouraged on this Lord's day. Dear God, that you would bring healing unto their bodies. And dear God, that you would send your Holy Spirit to lift them up into your presence. That you, dear God, are walking this path with them. That you're carrying them through these days. And dear God, we pray in your mercy uh, for our uh, number, dear God who are continuing to mourn the loss of loved ones. And we pray, especially this morning, uh, for their souls. Dear God, may they have comfort in the resurrection and in the assurance that we have in these truths. God, we continue to ask your prayers to be uh, with uh, our uh, schools and with our teachers and administrators and students. We continue to pray, dear God, that you will give wisdom uh, give uh, uh, eyes to see. God, we especially pray uh, for our teachers, dear God, as, as they deal with so much uh, from day to day. We pray, dear God, that you will continue to help them through these times. And dear God, we ask your blessings to be upon our covenant children this morning. 
We pray for them as they face the struggles and trials every day. We pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit will guard their hearts and their minds from the attempts of the evil one to lead them astray. God, we pray again for the promises that were made to them in baptism. We pray, dear God, that they would look back to their own baptism and remember again the promises that you have placed upon their hearts, that they are members of this covenant family, that they are blessed in these ways. May you encourage them as they grow both in body and in spirit. That they will flower where they've been planted. And that we might be the beneficiaries of their fruit. Both this day and in the future. For that is one of the greatest promises that you have made unto us as the Psalms speak unto the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren whom we have been praying for for generations. Now we continue to ask for the answering of those prayers. God, we ask these things again in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we continue to worship you this morning, we do so in spirit and in truth, trusting in your grace and in your mercy. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we come to our sermon text this morning from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Again, let us stand for the reading of God's word. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning there at verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you have given us these words on this day, we pray again for the work of your Holy Spirit that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth that we might again walk therein. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. One of the books of the Bible that most assuredly the Apostle Paul had in mind as he wrote those words was the book of Proverbs. Now, Proverbs is a book that uh, we probably don't spend enough time in, either on the Lord's Day or generally speaking. It's one of those books of the Bible that we all know about, but again, it's not really normally part of our devotional time. But one of the things about the book of Proverbs is that it lays out wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? What does it mean to be wise? I know some of y'all are uh, fans of you know, older, uh, kind of mystical uh, fiction. And, and one of the things about kind of old mystical fiction is that there's always kind of a Merlin-type character. You know, an old man who is probably a hermit of some kind, who lives out in the woods by himself, maybe even in a cave, right? And he usually has a really long beard and it's usually unkept. And you go and see him when you have a question about your life. Now, usually in these kind of books, they involve some kind of quest, right? Some kind of adventure, uh, some kind of seeking of a treasure. And you go to him and you want him to discern the path forward. And sometimes that's the way we treat the book of Proverbs. It's kind of this book that's uh, an ancient uh, thing, and we only go to it in, uh, in, in certain times. 
But one of the beauties of the book of Proverbs is that this really is the standard for how we are to live our lives. In fact, that's the whole reason it was written. It was written by Solomon to one of his sons. Again, the book opens, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And the reason he writes, he tells us in verse 2, is to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. So here again is the basics, right? The, the foundation of what it means to receive understanding and wisdom. It is so that justice, judgment, and equity are paramount in the lives of a believer. Now, think about what these words mean. First of all, what does justice mean, right? Justice is a word that is very popular in our day. And then most people who are using the word justice don't really want justice, right? They want retribution, right? They want to be paid for something that they had nothing to do with. Now, justice is not that. Justice is receiving the due reward for an action. Now, for Christians, what's one of the things that gives us peace and comfort? The fact that God is just. And for Christians, what does it mean that God has been just with us? Again, that's the whole foundation of the gospel, isn't it? That God has been just with us through the sending of his only begotten son. Because what do every human being on the earth deserve, right? Everyone deserves hell and damnation for their sins. Everyone deserves the wrath of God because those are, that is the wages of sin. And we, because we're sinners, cannot pay back what is owed to the Lord. So we need someone to pay that on our behalf. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has been sent to do this, right? Because God is a just God and God requires payment for sin. He sent the only begotten Son, the one without sin, so that sinners, you and I, could receive the justice of God. I could receive the blessing of salvation through the gift of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Again, his obedience unto the law. These things are why, again, we are seated here today, why we are listening to the preaching of the word, because we believe in justice. And again, as Christians, we also believe in judgment and equity. And this ties itself right back into the gospel as well. Right? We believe that God is just. We believe that he is a God of judgment, a God who will require what he has asked for. So if God has told us, thou shalt have no other gods before me, what does the Lord tell us? That we should have no other gods before him, right? This isn't complicated. So God is a God of judgment. He requires things of us. So if we believe in a God who is just, we believe in a God who has brought justice to bear for sin, we also believe in a God who has called us to live and act in certain ways. And again, this goes back to the equity of this verse. Again, what does it mean for something to have equity? Right? Well, that's not exactly what we mean here. right? We're not talking about you know, home values and things like that. Right? That's not what equity is talking about in the book of Proverbs. Again, this is focused once more on equality, on what, again, it means for those who have received the judgment of God, the justice of God, how they are then to respond to the great and awesome gift of the gospel. Again, how does the Lord Jesus lay this out in his testimony? What does the Lord require of us? How does he summarize the law? First of all, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our strength, and with all our being. 
right? And then we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? That's what equity means. That is our response to the goodness that Christ has laid upon us in the gospel message. Now again, what does this all have to do with what Paul is laying out in Ephesians chapter 4? Well again, remember his whole point, his whole purpose in this fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians is to remind us as a body of Christ, as a church of the living God, as one faith, one baptism, those who serve one Lord, that we are to act in wisdom in accordance with what we have received as a body in all that we do. Whether it's in worship, whether it's in daily life, whether it's what you do at work or home or whatever. Everything is to be done in accordance with wisdom, with understanding, and with a remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross and what you have received from that gift. Notably, the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? The great comforter who dwells within you. Here, verse 17 again. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So here we have the, the first statement. You who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, who have been called out of darkness and into the light of the gospel truth, you are no longer to walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And again, notice how Paul qualifies this. How do the Gentiles walk? In the futility of of their mind. Well, what does that word mean? What does is, what is something mean to be futile, right? What is futility? Right? Futility is teaching a dog calculus. Right? A dog is not capable of that, right? Now, it may also be futile to teach me calculus, right? There, there are certain things, again, that are impossible. Right? That's what futility really means. It's the impossibility of the attempt. Now, what does it mean then that Gentiles walk in futility? Well, what, do, what, what did God create all men to do? Right? What's the first question in the Shorter Catechism? What is the chief end of man? Right? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. What is every human being's first action? Right? They are glorifying God. Well, what, how do the Gentiles accomplish that? They don't do that. And why not? Because how are they walking? Right? In the futility of their minds, right? They are seeking to serve God. Now, it may seem a little strange to talk about it that way. But again, remember what does Paul say in Romans chapter 1 about all men? Right? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You ever, you ever wondered why every culture known to man has a God? When, when you go into a, a, a band or a, a, to an island in the South Pacific, they have some kind of religion set up. They have some kind of God set up. And what is their intent in that? Is it not to serve God? But what is happening there? Is the God of the scriptures glorified in their worshiping of the sun or of the moon or of the waves or whatever? Well, obviously not, right? God is not glorified into that, and that's why their worship is futile. It serves no purpose. In fact, what does it really do but bring God's wrath down upon them? And that was part of the uh, witness that we see, for example, in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. You remember there, when Jesus is talking to her, and she asks a question about, you know, in the future, where are we going to worship? And what does Jesus say? Well, first of all, y'all got it all wrong, right? Because what are the Samaritans doing? Are they going to Jerusalem? No, they're not, right? What are they doing? They're worshiping there in Samaria. Where had God told the people to worship in the Old Covenant? In Jerusalem, at the temple. And of course, they had received this from the tradition of Jeroboam. 
Remember when Jeroboam broke away uh, from the southern kingdom? Of course, in some ways, Jeroboam kind of gets a bad rap, but uh, because Rehoboam wasn't exactly you know, a, a piece of cake either. But Jeroboam set up false places of worship in the northern kingdom. And even though they were saying with their lips they were worshiping Jehovah, who were they worshiping? They were worshiping the devil because God had not commanded those sites to be made. So again, the worship of the Samaritans, the worship of the northern kingdom was futile because it was not done in the way that the Lord had prescribed, the way that the Lord had commanded in his word. So again, when Paul here is talking about the futility of the Gentiles, again, it begins with their worship. It begins with the fact that they are seeking the Lord in all the wrong ways and in all the wrong places. Again, we, we hear that and we think about you know, Gentiles that dwell among us. Because right? when Paul's talking about Gentiles, he's not talking about you know, ethnic here. Right? He's not using Gentile in the way that the Bible sometimes uses Gentile to describe everybody who's not a Jew. Right? Gentiles are unbelievers. Right? People who do not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about unbelievers around us today, you know, the, you know, the sociological literature, you know, let's talk about the nuns. Right? People who don't have a God, or at least tell the um, you know, the pollsters, right, that they don't believe in God, right? They're either openly atheists or they just don't care. And, you know, we hear that and we, you know, remember what the Bible tells us again, that there is no such thing as an atheist, right? Everybody worships a God. Well, what do the Gentiles worship in our culture? First of all, they worship themselves, right? Because their goal is what? Their goal is Pleasure, like fleshly pleasure. Everything is made for that purpose. You know, there was a, a song back in the 80s that I will uh, save you from singing, but right, the, the goal of the song was working for the weekend. And, and you think about that mentality, right? Well, that's good, right? If you're a Christian, right? You should be working for the weekend because what's on the weekend? Right? The Sabbath day, the Lord's day, right? Everything is building up for the Lord's day. But is that what that song is talking about, right? No, that song was not a big hit on Christian radio, right? That song was talking about Friday night, Saturdays, Sundays, where you can go out and worship yourself, either by you know, taking the bottle onto your lips or uh, by all numbers of sexual moralities or by going out and doing X, Y, or Z. Right? That is, again, the way the Gentiles walk, right? Now, think about, again, the language of futility there. Is it ever enough? Right? Well, what always happens on Monday morning? They start planning for the next weekend, wanting to top whatever happened the weekend before. And what, what happens the next Monday? They want to top what happened the weekend before. Do they ever get to a point where they are satisfied? Now, I'm sure you know people like this. What eventually happens to lives of people like that? Eventually, they're destroyed in some way or another. Right? Because they are continually to seek the pleasures of the flesh, and then either through disease or through some other nature, they fall flat on their face. This is very similar to what we see with the, the, the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Right? This man had all the worldly benefits and pleasures of this life, but what happened at the end of his life? He went to hell. What good were his riches and his homes and all those things when he was dead? Well, they were worth nothing. They, they, they earned him no place. They, that's the definition again of futility. But for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, how then should we live? Right? Because even though Paul here is, is speaking in a negative way, right, we need to hear these words and put them again in a positive place. What is the call of the believer then? What is our chief end? 
Now again, it's the same. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How then should we walk? Should we walk in the futility of our minds like the Gentiles do? Or should we walk in the wisdom that God has provided for us in the Holy Scriptures? Again, I hope all of us are saying, yes, yes, that's how we should live. And yes, that is true. That's how we should live. But I want you to take a moment and ask that question of yourself this morning. Is that how you are living today? Are you living in accordance with the way that the scriptures have laid things out? And that's a question as much for myself as anyone else. And when we think about that, right, we start getting pricked a little bit, don't we? We start seeing you know, ways in which we have established ourselves, the ways in which we have allowed, again, the things of the Gentiles to overwhelm the things of the Lord. We see this so often, especially today. You know, I'm 40 years old now, so I can start saying young people and mean it. But, you know, we see this with the way that young people are acting today. I don't know, I don't know how many times I've heard People say something like, well, everyone else is doing it. Well, what, what did your mom used to say when uh, you told her that everybody else is doing it? You know, if, if everybody else is jumping off a bridge, would, would you do it too? Well, is jumping off a bridge a futile thing? Yes, it is, right? Because what happens when you jump off a bridge? Well, a high enough bridge. Right? It doesn't end well, does it? But again, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to uh, kind of incorporate our lives and uh, model our lives after the ways of the Gentiles, or are we going to model our lives after the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ? And again, that's a very hard question today, because I don't know if you I don't know, spend any time in the world today, but... What's there more of in Clover, South Carolina right now? There's more Gentiles than there are Christians. And it's probably always been like that, but you know, it, it's kind of opening itself up more clearly in that way. And so living as Christ has called us to live is going to mean we're going to stick out a little bit more, maybe than when we did in the past. Right? It's going to mean that we're going to have to make some sacrifices that we didn't have to make in previous generations. But that question, again, we have to ask ourselves whenever we're confronted with these things is exactly what Paul says here. Do we want to be Gentiles or do we want to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because again, what's the end of being a Gentile? It's futility. It's destruction. It's judgment under the hands of a wrathful God. Notice what he says here in verse 18. Paul uh, continues this by saying, having their understanding darkened, having alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Again, this is another problem with walking in futility. You know, one of the most dangerous things we can do is when somebody tells us we're doing something wrong, is to continue to do it that way, right? Now, that's a pride issue, right? And that's an issue that afflicts us men, I think, a little bit more, right? You know, we're doing something, and somebody comes up to us and says we're doing it wrong. What do we start doing, right? We start doing it more wrong, right? Just to prove them wrong, right? But what, what does that do in the eyes of the Gentiles, Right? That just leads them further and further and further away from the kingdom of God. Right? Doubling down on your mistakes is not the way to go. Right? That's a little bit of free wisdom today. Right? Don't double down on your mistakes. If you make a mistake, what are you supposed to do? Right? Stop right? and start doing it the right way. Right? And again, that is part of the whole call of repentance in the witness of the preaching of the gospel. When Peter, for example, is confronted by Paul in, in the city of Antioch, remember that whole scene there, right? When Peter's hanging out with the Gentiles, he's fine eating you know, bacon and all that good stuff. But as soon as Jews show up, what does Peter do? He backs off and says, I don't know these people. I don't know what they're doing here. You know, they're Gentiles. 
And what does Paul do, right? Paul grabs him probably forcefully, if we can you know, read the words in, in Galatians, the way that Paul writes them, and drags him into a room and says, look here, buddy. Think about what you have done to these Gentiles. Right? You have scandalized them. Right? You have acted in a way that causes an offense to the gospel. And how does Peter then respond to Paul's rebuking of him? Well, again, the same way he did when he heard the third crow of the rooster. Right? With tears, with repentance, right? He receives that rebuke and remembers that if he wants to continue to act in the way that he's doing, that it's going to lead to destruction. But his friend has been faithful to him, faithful enough to confront him in his sin and turn him away from it. And now Paul Peter is no longer walking in the futility of his mind, but he's now walking in righteousness and in faith. And again, this is why, again, the call to repentance is so important in the life of the church. Because, again, one sin always leads to two sins. And two sins always leads to three sins. And eventually, you're that proverbial piece of snow rolling down the side of the mountain. Eventually, you're in an avalanche. And how likely are you able to stop an avalanche? You ever tried that? Well, probably not around here because it's been snow enough. But you know, if you see an avalanche come down a hill and you stick your hand up, what's going to happen? You're going to get bowled over, aren't you? Well, sin is exactly the same way. Right? If we do not repent, when we're given the opportunity to repent, what does Paul say is going to happen? Paul says in verse 18 that having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Again, there is a, uh, there's a stepping stone. Again, this all goes back again to this warning that Paul gives at the beginning of the passage that we are not to walk as the Gentiles walk. Because it's another aspect, again, of that walking as Gentiles walk. Again, when we are confronted with our sin, how are Christians to respond to that? Again, by repentance and by turning away from it. And, and why do Christians repent? You ever thought about that? Why, why, why do Christians repent? Again, it's not just kind of a bare action. It's not just because we're supposed to. Right? Christians repent because they understand sin for what it is. They understand that sin is an affront to a holy and a righteous God. It's one of the reasons why in the Old Covenant, when you sinned before the Lord, what did you have to do? You had to take an animal from your own flock and you had to sacrifice it to the Lord our God. Right? So you visibly saw this animal die. Because you sin. Right? And when we think about our own sin, what is it we're meant to think of? That Jesus Christ died for that sin. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for that sin. Right? And that should be the motivation for why we repent. Because sin is odious to God and Jesus Christ had to die for that sin. That, that is why Christians repent. Because again, we understand the magnificence of what has taken place in this. We don't treat sin as some light thing. Sin is not missing the mark. Sin is not being out there you know, shooting archery and just missing the middle of the target. Right? Sin is as if you had taken your bow and arrow and turned it around towards the crowd. Right? That is the weight of sin. And that's why sin cannot be trifled with. It cannot be treated as a light manner. Because what does sin do? Sin grows. Sin infects. Sin causes more and more to fall by the wayside. Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who have been past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness. Notice what else Paul says here about this walking in the ways of the Gentiles. 
What does it mean here when he says that they are past feeling? What does it mean when something is past feeling? Well, you know, what happens when you go numb? Right? One of my least favorite activities, I'm sure, for most of y'all is going to the dentist. Right? And what do they do at the dentist, especially when they're getting down in there? Right? They, they numb you, right? And what do you not feel? At least what are you not supposed to feel? Right? You're not, you don't feel them in there digging and breaking and drilling and all that stuff, right? You, you, you're past feeling. Now, you may feel it later, but, right, as it's happening, you're not feeling it. You're not recognizing what's happening. Well, that's what happens to those who continue to walk in the futility of their minds, who continue to walk as the Gentiles walk. Eventually, sin does not bother them anymore. They become immune in some ways to it. And think about how dangerous that is. Think about how awful that is. To be in a place spiritually where you give no thought to sin. And of course, that's exactly what Paul pictures for us in Romans chapter 1. Right? These people, having given themselves over to the world, what has continued to happen? They have continued to grow in lewdness. And eventually, what do we see happen in Romans chapter 1? You know, it's worth going back and looking at this and, and reading it. Again, Paul there is laying out exactly what happens, not only individually, but to a culture that has given itself over to sin. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And how did they get there? Remember, they professed to be wise. Right? They thought they were smart. Right? They thought they knew better than God. They thought they understood things better than the one who created the heavens and the earth. And they started to organize everything around themselves and their own ideas. And they walked as the Gentiles walked. And as they continued to walk down this path, we hear that God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies. This is a fearful thing because what is being pictured here, what's being pictured is God is removing his mercy from them. One of the reasons why the world is not as bad as it could be is because God's mercy is ever flowing. The reason why there aren't mass murderers running all over York County is because God's mercy is bountiful. But what happens when God starts peeling back that mercy a little bit? So let's pull him back his mercy and start allowing people to be as sinful as they can be. Well, again, that's what's pictured here in Romans chapter 1, right? They are being given up to their vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving their natural use of a woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Again, this is one of the reasons why it's important to recognize that the promotion of homosexual culture is not going to bring God's judgment. It is a sign that God's judgment is already here. It's a sign that God has given us over as a nation and as a world to gross wickedness because of the fact the world has sought after the ways of the Gentiles. And again, when you think about, again, just the very nature of homosexual desire and other things, what is more futile than that? Because what's the natural use of man and woman? Why did God make man, male and female? To unite them together as one. And what a male and female united together as one meant to produce but offspring and children. Right? That is the main reason for the act. But is that possible? Of course not, right? It's, it's, it's the very picture of futility. It's the very picture of what Paul is talking about here in the walking of the ways of the Gentiles. That's why these kinds of things are so dangerous. Because, again, they show a, a people and a world and a, 
a city and a nation that has already become numb to sin. That's already allowed themselves to no longer concern themselves with the things of the Lord. And so the call that we see here in Ephesians chapter 4 for us, because in some ways I'm kind of preaching to the choir this morning. You know, what, what are we to do in light of these things? Well, again, we need to be careful and follow what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Again, it's easy for us to look out unto the world and point out all their sins and point out all the ways they have become numb to the teaching of Christ. But what's that old saying about if you point one finger out, what happened? You got three pointing right back at you, right? I guess exactly what Jesus means there when he talks about the speck and the law. And so if we want to see our culture, if we want to see the nation, if we want to see the world turn away from the futility of the Gentiles, right, it begins right here. Right, we have to be the ones exhibiting to the world why it is awesome and wonderful to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We have to show the world what it means to live in the wisdom of our Almighty Father. When the prophet Jeremiah is warning uh, uh, Judah and Benjamin of the coming destruction at the hands of the Babylonians, one of the things that he tells them to do is to go back to the old path. And you hear that imagery. You, you see that imagery in your mind. And what does, what does that mean? What it means is, is that we're not as smart as we think we are. What it means is, is that the ways of the Lord are laid out for us as clear as day. You know, one of the neatest things I've ever seen in my life was going to a, a national park in Kansas where they, you can see the, uh, the runners of the, um, of the uh, wagons as they went along the Oregon Trail. And the ruts are still there. You could literally follow the ruts all the way to Oregon if you wanted to. And that's what is pictured here by the old paths. And that's why Paul is warning the Ephesians here in chapter 4. Remember, God has laid out the ways of the world. Or excuse me, the ways of the church. And we need to get back in those ruts. We need to get back into those old paths. We need to remember that what's been laid out for us in the scriptures is not complicated. The ways of the Lord are so much greater than the ways of the world. But we need to believe it. We need to act like we believe it. We need to trust in the Lord in these things. And as we come to the table this morning, this is one of the ways that we show the world. That we trust in him and we trust in his ways and we trust in the old paths. For it's in the elements, it's in the means of his grace that we have the answer. Trusting in the power of these means to grow us in his mercy and to remind us of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that you have given us this time to consider your word and think of the ways in which you have given unto us your kingdom and your blessing. We pray, dear God, for your continued mercy. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our opening uh, Bible song. Bible song 242. Again, we'll sing the first uh, two verses and then uh, we will.